Okay, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share those poll results with everyone. Um, looks like a good, over half of you are brand new, just learning. So that's actually great. You're in the exact right spot because uh, this is our fundamentals workshop. So we're gonna go over all of those super basic uh, pieces of the grant and kind of all the, the, the fundamental rules around it. And then we have a couple of um, more seasoned folks in the room, um, you know, heritage capital projects, uh, the big rules don't necessarily change um, very often at all ever <laughs> because those are uh, uh, state uh, state statute. Um, but some of the policy tweaks and some of the application forms we tweak uh, from year to year. So it is good to kind of get a refresher even if you are um, uh, a returning grantee. So, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close out that poll. Um, and then David, if you want, wouldn't mind keeping an eye on the uh, waiting room, letting people in while I share screen because that uh, is uh, tricky sometimes to do both. Okay, well, welcome everyone um, to the Heritage Capital Projects uh, Grant Fundamentals Workshop. I am, uh, there we go. I'm Dave Bairston. I am the Director of Heritage Outreach here at the Washington State Historical Society. I manage this grant program uh, and my colleague David uh, Sinjak is on the uh, uh, call as well. So he is the person who kind of is the frontline reimbursements uh, person. He'll he'll be someone you're you're interacting with a little bit um, more when um, if and when you become a grantee. Um, he's the one that kind of does the first pass at all of the the nitty gritty of the reimbursement details. So, but for the for application purposes and for sort of general questions and um, application assistance, I'm your main contact, and then I'll pull David in if and when uh, I've got uh, specific questions that I need his his help with. So there, here's my contact information. Um, we will definitely be sharing out these slides um, and posting them on our website. So don't feel like you have to scramble to write everything down. We'll definitely send this um, info out. So I wanna begin by talking about the kind of purpose or mission statement, if you will, of the Heritage Capital Projects Grant, and that is to provide public access to history. That is the, the meaning and purpose of the grant. And the state of Washington has a lot of different grant programs. Um, and sometimes there's overlap between um, different grant programs that um, you may be eligible for. Um, you know, there's a historic courthouses grant, there's the building for the arts, there's lots of different ones. Um, and so we really encourage people to, to pursue the grants that most closely align with their project purpose. Um, and for us, um, we would like to see a project purpose of providing public access to history. Um, additionally, Heritage Capital Projects is a capital grant only, which means that it only provides funding for facilities. So we don't provide funding for exhibits or programs or anything like that, um, but we can provide a kind of support for everything around an exhibit. So, you know, like, um, uh, flooring and walls and painting and all the all the facility pieces that um, that support the history work that you're doing. We'll start with a, a little bit of background on the program. Uh, it was established in 1995. Um, you can see the kind of RCW, the Revised Code of Washington and the Washington Administrative Code numbers there that really um, outline the fundamental pieces of the program and, and the rules that are in statute. Um, and over the, the last, you know, 30 years, uh, it's provided over $100 uh, million in funding to uh, heritage and history-based projects in Washington. It is state funding, so it is... Um, a bit of a long process. I just kind of want to say that up front. Uh, there's, you have the application process, which is what we're starting now. Um, and then there is a ranked list sent to the legislature and we'll go into more detail uh, in a minute on all this. Uh, there's a ranked list sent to the legislature and then the legislature has to include that list in the state capital budget, um, which means that no grant funded work can begin until that budget cycle starts. And you can see that schedule um, there in the middle, lower middle 
Um, the application will be due in June of this year, but the grant funds will not be available at the earliest until July of 2025. So that's something to be very aware of. This is really a long-term kind of planning grant. Um, and I've heard it described as the, the last third of funding because you kind of have to have a lot in place um, with your match and other things in order to, to take advantage of it. And also in order to plan kind of long-term for that, that long funding cycle. Digging a little deeper into that schedule, here is a list of important dates for this cycle. Um, again, this is, uh, we'll send this out and this is also listed in the guidelines document, um, but we're, we're right here at um, the, the second bullet here with the fundamentals workshop. Uh, we've got a couple other more detailed workshops coming up where we'll we'll go through the application form and we'll and we'll get into kind of the nitty gritty of how to submit. But today we're really talking kind of those uh, big broad strokes, big rules for for the program. Um, and then you can see a little bit later uh, kind of how how long the approval final approval process is. We've got. Um, Stage two due in June, uh, you're ranked in September, and then January through June of next year is the legislative um, session where they determine the budget. And then finally, July 1st of um, 2025 is when we can start contracting and potentially um, start reimbursing grant dollars after you're under contract with us. All right, so first and foremost, uh, we have a very detailed guidelines document, which we have revamped a little bit this year. Um, it's been a little bit, um, disor no, dis disorganized is a strong word. Uh, it's been a little bit um, piecemeal in the past. It had kind of gotten added to over the years and we took some time to really reorganize it this year. Um, to try to make it a lot more of a useful tool for you. Um, we rearranged the information to follow the application form and literally walk you through step-by-step step based on the information we're asking for in the application form. So essentially we kind of have the section that you'll see in the application form, uh, some information about the rules related to that section, and then a little description of, in this box, we're asking for this information. And so it's really designed as a tool for you to have sitting next to you as you work on your application and just like reference uh, with the, the form on the screen and the, and, the, and the guidelines next to you. So hopefully, um, especially for returning grantees, this will be uh, um, a little bit more organized uh, to your process. Um, we also added some more information, uh, specific uh, dis descriptions of each attachment document we're asking for. In the past, it's just been kind of lists of documents and we've kind of added more information about what we're looking for there. Uh, more thorough explanation of some, some confusing topics. Um, and, an, a, and a big change is that for the narrative section, which is sort of the last section in, in stage two, um, <clears throat> we've added some prompts to sort of help you, uh, to guide you in answering those questions um, to be most, uh, um, uh, to provide the most helpful information for, for the, the panelists. And we'll talk a lot more about that in, in future workshops, uh, getting into those, those details. So here are the sections of the guidelines. Um, you can see that um, it's broken out into um, eligibility review stage one and uh, full proposal stage two. So um, that, that brings up a very important point that um, this is a two-stage application process. And we do that because um, it's a lot of work. We recognize that. We try to make it as, as, as uh, streamlined as we can, but there are a lot of rules and um, um, sort of due diligence we need to do uh, as a state program. So what we do is that we um, have eligibility review stage one first, which basically um, we want to try to make sure that you are an eligible organization with an eligible project before you then go ahead and spend a lot of time assembling a bunch of additional uh, documentation and paperwork and writing long narratives, um, you know, so that we can make sure we're all on the same page that, that you are actually eligible. So this, um, this first stage, we will go into a lot more detail in an upcoming workshop, like I said, walk through the form, talk about each section of it. So um, hopefully David can put in the chat a link to register for that workshop if you haven't already. Um, that'll be coming up in a couple of weeks in early March. Um, so 
this part of the application kind of asks basic information about your organization, your property, your project. Um, particularly, do you have long-term site control of the property? Um, just a general summary and timeline of your project and then some general budget numbers. So we, we tried to make it as, as simple as possible um, and uh, easy entry point for, for then um, figuring out if you if this is the right fit for you, if this, if this grant program will work for you. So that workshop is gonna be on March 7th for more details about that. And then the eligibility review will be due March 29th. Um, you can submit it at any time uh, and we will review it. And then you can have access to the rest of the application. Uh, we just kind of draw that deadline at March 29th because we gotta, gotta give people a deadline uh, to, to get, get to the next stage. But feel free to uh, submit that as soon as you're ready. We can review it internally, um, ask you any questions if we need to, um, and then get any clarifications. And if everything looks good, we can just uh, send you on to the next stage uh, as soon as um, you're, you're ready with that. And then stage two, again, we'll have a workshop uh, devoted to all the details about this. That workshop will be April 25th, um, and that you will notice is after stage one, the stage one deadline. So this is really going to be geared toward folks who have passed the eligibility review already um, and are working on that second stage. Uh, so it will, <clears throat> excuse me, as you can see here, uh, more and more kind of detailed information about the governing body, uh, very detailed scope of work, project budget, um, proof of your match, and then um, those project narratives that, that I mentioned before. So another workshop, which um, uh, link in the chat that David will provide to register for that, um, if you would like to right now, we'll also send you that link again um, after the eligibility review uh, uh, stage as well, if, if you do it, um, indeed uh, decide to submit and, and pass that, so you know that it's there. Okay. So um, talking about those big fundamental uh, uh, rules and regulations for heritage capital. First, is my organization eligible? These are the eligible applicant types for the heritage capital projects um, uh, grant program. So local governments, which includes uh, uh, cities and towns or county governments, tribe, tribes and tribal entities like cultural centers, um, nonprofits in Washington state with a 501c3 uh, designation. So you do need to be federally recognized as a nonprofit, um, public development authorities and ports. Okay. Another big uh, piece of heritage capital is that applicants must demonstrate long-term site control. So for a capital project, there are state dollars going into um, a capital project, so a property. Um, and as part of that, uh, the state requires long-term control because we then have a monitoring period after uh, after the grant is over. And so um, the state wants to essentially make sure that the investment is secured, um, that uh, the organization will maintain the property and then continue providing that public access to history that I mentioned earlier. So long-term property control is defined as owning a property um, or a long-term lease which is 13 years past the um, end of the funding biennium. So the funding biennium that the application is for is for 2025 to 2027. So add 13 years to 2027 and you get June 30th, 2040. So as part of your eligibility review, you will need to demonstrate to us that either you own the property or you have a long-term lease through 2040. Uh, a month to month, uh, lease is not sufficient. Um, and I know that there are some organizations out there that have, you know, 30, 40 year old month to month leases with a city or, or another like very um, stable entity. Um, unfortunately, that is not sufficient. So if that is the case for you, um, let's talk uh, and we'll see if we can find um, a way to structure the grant application um, with your um, with your lessor. Uh, to, to see if um, you can be eligible to apply. Okay. 
Oh, as I mentioned, uh, the reason that we require that long-term uh, property control is because of that 13-year monitoring period after project completion. So you, during those 13 years, from 2027 to 2040, uh, you will need to retain that site control. You cannot sell the property or break your lease. Um, you need to maintain the property, uh, you know, keep it in good working order and follow historic standards if you have a historic preservation project, um, and then continue providing that public access to history, which, as I mentioned, is, is the purpose of our grant. Um, if you do not uh, uh, follow these, um, unfortunately, uh, you will be required to repay your grant dollars with interest. Uh, so um, that, that has never happened in the history of the program and we would not, not ever like it to happen, um, but it is, it is fairly serious. So um, with this, the public funds investment, the state wants to see that long-term public access to history uh, uh, for the state of Washington. Okay, so those are the big uh, um, kind of organizational property rules. Now let's talk about the projects um, and the specifics of how you are uh, going about your project. So is my project eligible? As I mentioned earlier, grant dollars can only support capital, meaning facility costs, but that does kind of include a very wide range. It can be new construction, the construction of, an, of a new facility to provide public access to history, like a, um, a, a new history museum or a maritime gallery, something like that. Um, existing billing rehabilitation, whether historic or not historic, if the um, if the uh, if, if the function of the building is to provide public access to history as a museum, but it was built in the, you know, in the 90s, um, we can still provide support for upgraded HVAC or remodeling or different things like that, um, as long as it's going to uh, continue providing that public access to history. And then of course we can support rehabilitation of historic structures um, uh, as, as many, we have a lot of those projects that, that, that we support. We can also support architectural or engineering design services um, and property acquisition. So those are um, related to facility costs that we that we can that that HCP dollars or um, that you can use as match. And just a reminder, we don't fund exhibits or programs, but everything kind of around those exhibits and programs as far as a facility that provides public access to history. Okay, big rule, <laughs> grants are reimbursement only, which means uh, that you have to spend the money first before we will reimburse you your grant dollars. The state of Washington does not advance grant funds. So you need to have enough kind of liquid uh, cash on hand uh, throughout the process of your grant to be able to spend money on the capital project um, and then, uh, submit for reimbursement and then receive those, those grant dollars. So that is something very, very important um, to keep in mind. Of the process of, of the grant, um, you will need to also very carefully document all of your expenses because when you submit for reimbursement, we check to make sure that um, you spent the money uh, on the scope of work that we agreed to in our contracting process. So you'll need to keep very um, good records. Um, and like I say, um, if we we can do partial reimbursements throughout the process, you don't have to, you know, especially for larger projects, you don't have to spend it all and then get reimbursed at the very end. Um, we can do sort of gradual reimbursements um, as we go and as makes sense for your project. And I'll just um, state a quick reminder that um, those reimbursements cannot start until after July 1st of 2025. Uh, so any any match, any, any project work happening now can only count as match. We cannot reimburse you for past work. We can only reimburse you for work done after that contract, that grant contract with you and the state of Washington with the State Historical Society is, is in place. Speaking of match, um, state dollars can only account for 33.33% of your total project cost, um, which means two things. Uh, 
a two to one match is required. So you provide the other two, you provide two out of every $3 uh, for your, your grant project, which can be cash, it can be in kind, um, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but that also means that no other state funds can go toward uh, the project. So no other state grants, um, no direct appropriations through your, your local legislator. Um, you cannot use other state funds as match for HCP, uh, unfortunately. So um, that's something to keep in mind. If you, if you have um, previously had a direct appropriation, which are, are often referred to as community projects and are routed through the Department of Commerce, um, if that has happened with uh, for your project, those dollars cannot use, be used as your match. So. All right. <laughs> so for match, we do allow you to go back up to six years for just the match portion. As I, as I said, we can't reimburse you for past expenses, but we can count that as match. So for this upcoming uh, cycle, um, you can see that that match will date all the way back to July 1st of 2019. So if you've got, if you've been spending money on big capital uh, projects or you purchased your property within the last six years, all of that investment can potentially count towards your match. And then again, I know I've said this a few times already, but you, you can't start any grant funded, um, you can't spend any grant funded expenses until after you're under contract, which again at the earliest will happen July 1st, 2025. Moving right along, grant requests um, have a minimum of 10,000 and a maximum of 1 million. Again, this can only be 33% uh, or a third of your project. So if you were to request um, $10,000, you would need to show a total project cost of, of about 30,000 or more. And the same with a million, it would need to be um, 3 million or more total project cost in order for it to, to, to achieve that two to one match. We do have kind of a special um, match uh, rule for smaller projects. For um, requests under $100,000, where it's the, the grant amount is under $100,000, um, was 100,000 or less, I should say, I should have had a or equal to there. Um, you can have any ratio of match to, in, or excuse me, cash to in-kind. Um, so it could be 100% in kind, it could be 100% cash, it could be, um, you know, any any mixture of that. But for anything above 100,000, in kind can count up to half. So you will have to show uh, half cash for larger projects. <laughs> Another big piece of heritage capital that um, that folks sometimes run into trouble with is uh, following state laws. So this is state money. You're required to follow state laws for capital projects. WSHS is not a regulatory agency. So this may mean that you have to interact with other agencies because they're the ones that regulate those laws. The three that we kind of run into the most, um, uh, run into questions with the most are executive order 2102 which means you have to consult with tribes and DAP. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which actually we're um, changing the way that we do that this year. In the past, we've required each uh, applicant to reach out to tribes individually. Um, and we've recognized that that creates a lot of work for tribes. <laughs> and that is not something that we want to, uh, to perpetuate. So our plan this year is to collect information from that elig eligibility review and then we as the state agency will will communicate to tribes what grants are being proposed and ask if they have any concerns we will be asking you about ground disturbance in the eligibility review um, and then communicate back to you and if the tribes do have concerns about your project then you will need to engage with with tribes and 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 mitigate those concerns each applicant is still uh, required to consult with the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, that DAHP there on the on the slide. So that that piece hasn't changed, but we will be kind of taking the first uh, um, the the lead on the tribal uh, outreach for the first uh, contact. 
prevailing wages, you are required to uh, communicate to your contractors that you select that prevailing wages are required and that <clears throat> the, the contractors need to pay those wages. This is um, uh, regulated through the Department of Labor and Industries. Um, and I've got, we've got some basic out, um, outlines in the guidelines of, of the, the process for that. But if you need some more detailed information or your contractor is not familiar with LNI or, or prevailing wages for any laborers, you'll need to contact Labor and Industries directly. And then occasionally high performance public buildings. So this is these are lead standards for large buildings. Um, this is 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 not super common um, because you have to have a new construction over 5,000 square feet or a, a rehabilitation project that is more um, than 50% of the assessed value of your property. So if you if you have a larger project, um, let let us know and uh, we can kind of look at the details of this this requirement and, and help you out with that. Most folks won't uh, won't need to worry about that. All right. <clears throat> so, how are the applications evaluated? These are the categories that um, will correlate to the narrative sections in stage two, and they are also the categories. Excuse me. That the um, that the um, panelists will be evaluating uh, your application on. Each narrative section relates to one of these categories, but the um, panelists will will you know be evaluating your application as a whole, including all the information provided in previous sections before the narrative that that support all the information you provide in your narrative. So first is project purpose, as I mentioned, uh, public access to history. Um, one thing that's very important to keep in mind, especially if you have a historic preservation project, is that you must provide his, history interpretation in addition to the, the sort of um, physical rehabilitation of the historic property. So um, it doesn't have to be you know, extensive. It just has to be something for the public to learn about the building, learn about the history beyond just kind of seeing a, a historic building. So. We have folks that have a couple maybe outdoor signs, maybe some historic photographs on the interior with some captions and some information, maybe some tours. Um, it, again, it doesn't have to be extensive, but there does have to be kind of that opportunity for interpretation and, and learning uh, for the public. And then of course, a lot of applicants are, are history museums themselves. And so that's their whole whole purpose and uh, mission. So that's, that's well aligned if you are uh, already doing lots of history interpretation at your facility. Community value, um, so community need, community support, um, and long-term public benefit, especially as it relates to uh, public access to history. So that'll be another uh, factor that is considered. Project planning, this includes kind of your readiness to initiate a project, uh, be cost-effective, complete the project within the two-year cycle um, of, of, the, of the grant uh, term, the budget term. Um, we ask questions or we have prompts in the narrative section about like, how did you determine your scope? How did you determine your budget? Like how much planning went into this and how did you kind of um, <clears throat> sort that out? Organizational capacity. So do you have um, an effective project team with the ability to manage a capital project? It's a, it's a, it's a big undertaking for a lot of folks. Have you assembled the right team? Do you have a functional board that's on, on um, in agreement about this, that works together, that is able to work with the project team, you know, um, how smoothly can your team work together? Um, and then the organizational stability, that 13 year monitoring past project completion. Do you have the capacity to continue operating and maintaining the facility for those 13 years and continue um, providing the public access to history long-term? And also make sure that that public access to history is, um, you know, aligned with field best practices. Are you are you doing interpretation um, appropriately and including 
um, many different uh, uh, stories of, of different groups? Are you following the historic standards if you have a historic building? You know, a not that you have to be perfect, but the, are you striving to um, to be an effective uh, um, history interpreter or uh, preservationist? Which we can help you with. <laughs> we have a whole department um, to help you uh, uh, do the work of history and and um, do the work of preservation. So uh, we can we can assist with 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 that work. All right, um, we're gonna wrap up the the presentation portion here with just some basics of how to get started. <clears throat> And then we'll open it up for questions. I'm hoping to, to leave a good 20 minutes at the end here for questions. Um, so before you get started, I would direct you back to that guidelines document. Um, it's very it, it's 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 very detailed, um, but again, hopefully, um, is a little bit more um, step by step easier to follow this time around. Um, I also have a little screenshot of our uh, grant landing page, the link here, washingtonhistory.org slash HCP. And you can find this document, um, which of course we'll, we'll email you links and, and everything to it. But if you're ever um, trying to find it, uh, there's a direct link here um, on the sidebar. And then this um, kind of slideshow, the second slide has a link right to the guidelines here. And then after you've read through the guidelines and you feel like um, your project is a good fit and you're ready to get started, um, all uh, grant applications will need to be submitted online through our virtual heritage portal. And in order to find that, again, this is that same uh, website, but um, the, the last link here on the side is the link to the portal and then the third, um, slide here in the slideshow is a link to the portal. Uh, but you can also use this washingtonhistory.org slash portal, also heritage portal, heritage dash portal, they'll all work. We, we've, we've routed you to the, to the right place uh, with those short links. So this is what the landing page of the portal looks like. If you already have an account, um, you can use uh, this to log in. If you've forgotten your password, there's a forgot password uh, link here right under the sign in button, which you can use to get um, uh, a reset email. If you're brand new to the portal, there's a create an account now button down over here. And then there's also a link to a video that kind of walks you through how to sign up and how it's how it's all laid out. So we do, we only accept applications virtually through this uh, portal system, and it's it's basically a system of interconnected profiles. So there's a profile for each person. There's a profile for each organization. Each each app, grant application has its own form. If you're successful with the grant application, you will then have reports and other things uh, that that come along with that. So that's that's a form uh, in 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 the portal. And so after you register as a user, I will connect you to the organization account, and then each user um, can access all the information associated with that organization including the grant application, the reports, things like that. So it's a way for multiple people to access shared information, um, which means that as it says here, each user should register their own account. Um, and that is really helpful for us to be able to see, you know, who's in the system, who's working on stuff, who's making changes, who's submitting things. Instead of having a, a one login, a shared login for a whole organization, it's really helpful to be able to to know who's working on things. So every person should have their own login, should go to this screen if, if you don't already have an account and, and set up an account. Oh, registration, <laughs> register for your own account. And like I say, I, I manually link you to the organization on my end. Um, so it can take, you know, up to 24 hours or the next business day for me for me to get to that. So, if you don't see it right away, don't worry. Um, and if you don't see it after a day or two, send me an email. The emails uh, from the Heritage Portal 
um, it come, they'll come from a do not reply address that, <clears throat> that looks a little bit spammy. <laughs> so uh, be sure to check your junk and spam mail after you um, register. And uh, the portal is through a system called Flux. F-L-U-X-X. -X. Um, so you'll want to add at flux.io to your safe senders list um, in order to make sure that you're getting the emails from um, from the portal that are automatically generated, you know, the the registration email and in the future, you know, your 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 grant was submitted email, things like that. So um, be sure to uh, check that junk and spam. Uh, for that email and then add it to your safe senders list uh, when you do so you can get all um, information in the future. Okay. That is it for the formal presentation. Like I said, I'll we'll send these slides out to you and I'm happy to refer back to any of the slides that you saw today with questions. Uh, but I will go ahead and stop share for now. And I saw a lot happening in the chat. So I'm going to start there. I don't know, David, have you been kind of responding? Uh, I've been responding as we go, but they're all worth um, talking about. Talking about, okay. Uh, can federal funding be used as match? Yes, that is a great question. So um, federal dollars can be used as match, as can local dollars. <clears throat> Excuse me, getting over a cold. Um, you know, so if your city or county has a grant program or is 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 interested in directly funding your project, those government dollars, local government or federal government dollars can count as match. Great question. And David said yes in the chat. Um, does match need to be in hand by six, uh, June 7th or by the time of reimbursement? Another great question. So at the time of June 7th, which is when the full proposal is due, we require you to uh, provide 75% um, documentation of 75%, meaning it's either you have it in hand or it's reasonably expected, meaning you have a, a committed donor or you're, you have income that you're reasonably anticipating and you're able to demonstrate, you know, we, we earn such and such amount of dollars every year on this type of income. And by the time, you know, by the time of contracting a year from now, uh, because it is such a long uh, time period, you will you will have you know this much. Um, so we 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 want to make sure that that you're not just applying for the grant with with no plan for match, but we want to be as as flexible as we can. With um, we know um, it's a long time period, and 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 there's there's another year there to kind of secure the rest of the match. By the time of contracting, so July 1st, 2025, you must have 100% of your match uh, demonstrated. Um, again, it doesn't have to be a dollars in your bank account, but you have to know where all of your match is coming from. Uh, high performance public buildings, this might be a, a question for David. Uh, the, um, the, the state had the, the, the high performance public buildings requirement basically says if it's state dollars going toward a larger building, you have to meet LEED standards, which is, um, you know, um, building efficiency standards. So I don't know, David, if you want to make any more comments about that. Well, it, for those that aren't uh, familiar with it, LEED's just a point system uh, certification system for green building. It deals with site and materials and energy efficiency and whatnot. Uh, it's really rare. Most of the projects that it's going to apply to are already required to do it from some other program that they're they're involved in. These are generally multi-million dollar projects. Yeah. Yep. It is rare, but it, it does does happen. The Michelle asked about DAP, which is the Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation, our, a sister agency of ours. Um, if payments have been made for the project before contracting, we're counting that as match. Are those in kind or cash? This is a great question. So um Cash expenses are expenses that your organization as the applicant are making toward the project. So if you're paying for a contractor, you're purchasing materials, you're purchasing the property, that is all cash um, cash expenditures. So that can count as match before we're contracting <clears throat> and then match or grant after the contract is signed. In-kind specifically refers to 
a third party contributing to your project. That means either someone's straight up donating their time, donating materials, but that can also mean they are donating, they are paying for something for you. So what the what we see most often is, for instance, an, a heritage organization has a long-term lease with a city or a county, and the city or a county are, are like, we're gonna pay for the roof, and you can use that as match for your grant application. So that roof is being paid for by the city. <clears throat> the dollars are going from the city to the contractor, which means that's an in-kind donation because, because the heritage organization is not spending that money. The city is spending that money as a, as a third party. Excuse me. Um, so that is an important distinction. Funding that the applicant organization that we contract with is spending is cash and anything donated or paid for by a third party, even if they're a very close project partner, even if they're the property owner, if they're not on the contract uh, as as a as, as a our grantee, that's in-kind donation. Excellent question. For a historic district, like a campus that is listed, do infrastructure improvements, water, sewer, stormwater, pavement count as capital facilities projects? Yes. Um, all that kind of stuff that, that relates to the facility um, can count. So we have funded several projects where we'll do um, kind of uh, funds will go toward multiple related buildings in a historic district. They do need to kind of be connected to each other and if they're going to be in one application. Um, you know, a uh, historic district, we've funded um, buildings down on uh, down at uh, Fort Vancouver, you know, Officers Row down there. Um, so you can apply um, for um, grant dollars to apply to multiple related buildings. And that also includes all of the infrastructure, um, water, sewer, things like that. For an individual building, that also includes all the infrastructure for that one building. So electrical, um, you know, plumbing, uh, <clears throat> site work, all that stuff. Uh, we are are lucky to be able to have a, a very um, broad definition of, of capital work, basically anything that will support the functionality of the facility um, as it provides public access to history. All right, scrolling through, we have a 30 year permit through the Forest Service to use a building on federal land. Can we apply for state funding to do renovation work on the federally owned building? Yes, as long as that permit goes through June 30th of 2040, which actually brings up a good point. Uh, if you apply for a grant and you receive it and something, you know, very unforeseen happens uh, and you end up not being able to finish your project in the two year time frame from 25 to 27, you can request a reappropriation, which means basically take your grant funds from 2025 to 2027, put them in 2027, 2029, give you two more years. We don't recommend <laughs> relying on that because that the it's not guaranteed that the legislature will approve that. Um, they 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 have in the past. We have grants that have that have gotten those extensions, uh, but we really strongly urge folks to finish, if at all possible, in their original time frame. That said, if you if if that unexpected thing happens and you need that extension and you are and you receive it from the legislature, um, that will then bump your time frame out another two years. If you don't finish till twenty twenty nine, then your monitoring goes through uh, twenty forty two. So keep that in mind as well as you're uh, working on your projects. It's thirteen years from when the project is finished, and we we estimate that as like the end of the cycle for now, because uh, we're hopeful that most of you all will finish within the cycle. Um, but if if you get that extension and, and things get drawn out a little bit, um, so does the monitoring as well. Okay, David did a pretty thorough description of the DAHP Department of Archaeology and Historic Preservation. Uh, information in the chat. And that's actually something we'll go into a lot more detail in the eligibility review um, uh, workshop happening on March 7th. So um, if there's lots of questions about that right now, we can we can uh, talk about it more, but I'm just gonna keep scrolling because that's a, that's a detailed question that we will address on March 7th. Another question about a kind of museum campus from Elsa. Yes, 
yes, you may uh, apply for a, a project that encompasses multiple buildings. Can you apply if you apply in the last cycle? Yes. So um, we there are um, many situations where we get kind of return applicants um, either to continue a project or um, if an applicant owns multiple buildings. Um, there's yes, there's no penalty. There's no cons you know there's no like oh they got money last time they will will ding them a few points or or consider them less eligible. Um, you're completely eligible. Um, the uh, the the one extra comment I'll make about that um, <clears throat> is that uh, we all, in addition to not being able to use state dollars as match, we also do not permit you to apply to other state grants for funding in the same biennium. So if you got a grant last cycle, fine, you're totally eligible. But we want people to um, pick one program to pursue each biennium cycle. So don't go ahead and apply for Building for the Arts, HCP, and talk to your legislator about a direct appropriation all in one cycle. Pick one um, that aligns best with your project goals. Um, are you an arts org or are you a history org? You know, like which, which one aligns best <clears throat> and pursue that because state funding is limited. What constitutes a complete project? Is it possible to purchase materials that we use down the road, say in 2028? This feels like two different questions. Um, a complete project, uh, Elsa, do you mind uh, maybe uh, hopping on audio and clarifying your question on that one? Yeah, not at all. This came from one of my board members who wondered if it would be possible to get materials and then just hold on to the materials and install them later. Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So that okay. so that would that would count in that kind of like past match window that I discussed. Yes. So for if you if you purchased it now and mm -hmm. then wanted to install in well 2028 would be would be after the grant cycle so that would be yeah. the, the next grant cycle after this one that we're we're in right now or coming up to I should say mm -hmm. um but for the 2027 2029 which application will open you know 2 years from now mm -hmm. um that 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 six years prior purchase date will move up two years again. So between 2021 and mm -hmm. 2027. So yeah, if you were to purchase materials now, that click out yeah. as match, keep those receipts. <laughs> yes. And um, and then that that can all go toward toward your project. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Holly, what is considered documentation for the conflict of interest question on the application? Great question. We'll talk more about this in the eligibility review. If, if anyone has hopped on the portal and seen the form, we ask you. <clears throat> so in the past, we had everybody submit a conflict of interest form from every board member and staff person. That was very laborious. And um, we are trying this year to do it a little differently. Um, so instead of requiring you to submit a form for each person. We are at, we have kind of an open-ended question of, are there any potential conflicts in your organization? So that's, you know, board members who have personal relationships, board and staff who have personal relationships, maybe someone who has a personal relationship with a contractor you're planning to employ, like, you know, any of those personal relationships that are involved in the organization or the project. It doesn't mean you're gonna be ineligible. It just means you need to let us know up front. And then if um, and then if if we have further questions after this first stage, we'll 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 ask for a little bit of clarification on those. And Holly is asking about the documentation. So we, we have an open uh, box that says, you know, please list any potential conflicts. And then we have a second box that says, how did how did you how did you determine those conflicts? So um, best practice is for each organization to have um, regular uh, conflict of interest form signing, whether that's annually or, or uh, biannually, each board member is acknowledging um, their conflicts. Um, so that would be ideal if you were able to say in that second box, you know, we have a we have a conflict of interest form that every board member signs every two years or whatever, um, and just be able to say that. Um, that that's kind of what we are looking for, but if there's another way that you're able to kind of determine those conflicts, let us know. We are not asking you to attach that documentation here in stage one. Um, 
but we, like I say, we if if there's kind of a few questions we have about it, we may ask you to go ahead and attach that for stage two, uh, just for clarity, just for transparency um, moving forward. Our pre-development soft cost eligible expenses, uh, for example, market study, geotech study, boundary surveys, architect services, yes, yes, yes. Um, the one exception is feasibility study. So in order to be considered a capital project as defined by the state of Washington, it has to be a specific property with a specific purpose. So a feasibility study is, uh, there's a property, what are we gonna do with it? Um, and so that is not considered capital because it's it's not related to a specific project. It's, it's like, let's determine what the specific project is. Um, but once you have kind of, a project in mind of the property plus the use and kind of the 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 direction you want to go. Any sort of conditions assessments, um, design studies that you're doing for the facility um, uh, can count. So I'm not totally sure what you mean by market study. If that was related to um, uh, audience that may not be as applicable, we really uh, only can. Uh, count things that are related to the structure itself. Um, but yes, typically typically speaking, most of these things are, are would be eligible, uh, including permit costs and taxes and other things uh, related to to capital capital work. And Deborah's got a question. Is the value of historic property that is being transferred at no cost from a local government or nonprofit to be counted as in kind? Yes, absolutely. This is great. So um, what we will do if it's at no cost, um, then we need you need to just <clears throat> essentially be able to demonstrate the value of that property, what it would have cost if it were to have been purchased. <clears throat> and so you can either use the number that's on the tax assessor's value, which sometimes is a little little low, or you can get a professional um, real estate uh, um, evaluation. There's a, there's a specific term for them that I'm not, it's not coming to mind right now, but um, you can get a professional assessment done, assessment. Um, and we can use that number too, as long as it's a, it's a professional assessment. So yes, that's exciting that that is a, a potential for you. Um, the property has to have transferred in that six year window though. So it has to have transferred after July, 2020. First, 2029. Important caveat. We are notified that we're receiving a DAP Historic Theater grant. Are we still eligible to apply? Uh, right. Yes, Shara, you you understand it correctly. Yeah. So you're you're doing a grant this year with DAP. This is the 23-25 biennium. We're still in. So yes, absolutely, you're eligible to apply for the next biennium and kind of sequence that state funding. And you note in your comment also that that DAP grant cannot count as match, that is correct. And, and thanks for remembering that, that's exactly right. Uh, Ella, else another question. We are purchasing our property through an agreement with a seller, a deed of trust. Can our past payments count even though we haven't completed the purchase yet? Um, we are listed as the registered, owner, registered owners. Yes, as long as those payments are after July 1st, 2029, yes. And, um, and as part of the documentation, uh, of property site control, we'll ask for a copy of that that uh, uh, agreement with the seller and, and make sure that's all all buttoned up. All right, can an historic can an organization such as Historicor act as a contractor? Uh, yeah, we have we have we've we've had uh, folks use Historicor and uh, was the 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 folks the the Northport. People use David, the um, National Guard. National Guard. Yeah. yeah. So we, we've had, and then um, we had, I forget who was, uh, NPS folks were working on, National Park Service folks were working on the Georgetown steam plant. So yeah, we've had groups like that. Um, as long as, you know, they're, 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 uh, they're doing good work and, and you, they, that, that, that um, labor can be donated labor or it can be paid labor. So again, if you're paying Historicor as, um, and I don't know exactly how that program works, but if you're paying people as as the laborers, um, then that's a cash expense. If Historicor is paying them and the labor is essentially being donated to your project, then that's in kind. So <clears throat> something to keep in mind. Is renovating or repurposing a historic church new uses considered providing public access to history? 
uh, yes, as long as there is some history interpretation that goes along with that. So uh, interpretation about the community, the history of the church, um, you know, the architecture, different things like that, what, what, whatever, you know, we, we give you a little autonomy to go in whichever um, direction for history interpretation, but um, preserving a building, historic building, new use, uh, and a little information about its past and the community's history would be great. All right, we're working on a water irrigation project for a historical cemetery. This is not eligible for DAP historical cemetery grant. Would it still apply here? Um, yeah, we we have funded um, cemeteries in the past. Um, it's a, I I would say it might be a little bit less competitive of a grant as far as um, some of that um, that the the more um, subjective uh, pieces, but it. It would be eligible to do uh, capital improvements to a historic cemetery, as long again as there's some historical interpretation at the cemetery, um, you know, about the history there, and that that's publicly accessible. David, do you have any other thoughts on that? Um, no, it said it was ineligible for the um, historical cemetery grant. I'm, I would be interested to know why. Yeah, that the, it this... could be this. It could make it. It could be ineligible for this program too. The, can I answer? Um, it was they don't fund water projects. They don't fund water projects. That's so interesting because um, infrastructure is definitely considered cap a capital expense. So that just must be some specific thing to their grant that they don't that don't allow. Yeah. So that's interesting. Uh, and to that because we have a whole grant for we the state has a whole grant for cemeteries and it would make sense for. Um, <clears throat> you to go there but we can we can chat more about uh your project okay thank you specifically yeah can match come from come from the applicant yes douglas uh they must indeed come from the applicant so um uh that can be so again like i said if if the if the cash uh is in the applicant's possession and then is spent on the project that's a cash match if there's a third party donating to the project or, or paying for expenses on the project, that's that's in kind. So cash can be income that you earn, a grant you receive, that's not a state grant, um, you know, uh, uh, donations uh, from people, a capital campaign, any, any funds that are coming to your organization specifically, that's all that match, cash match that you're then spending on the project. Yourself. All right, we're at 11. Um, I'm happy to stay on and continue answering some questions uh, here in the chat and then open it up for a little bit of discussion. Um, so, but I understand that some folks may need to leave. This is all being recorded, so you can come back and catch catch the end if you need to. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and continue to keep answering questions here if folks want to stick around. Um, Clearly 20, 20 minutes wasn't enough for questions. So, so, but I'm glad that there's lots of interest in questions. So we'll, we'll just keep rolling with it. Um, and, and again, if you have to take off, no worries. And we'll send the recording out after. Uh, question from Rebecca. If for a previous grantee um, and not, not yet exhausted those funds, are we prohibited from applying again? Uh, great question, Rebecca. Um, not this time. So we have a rule basically that you can have kind of two open projects at a time and that that well I should say two um uh appropriations from the legislature so that could be um a grant that you're currently working on which you are um with uh, uh commerce under the commerce heritage capital project funding hmm. um a, a, a project you're cur currently working on and then one appropriation that we'll uh, we'll wait to contract with you um, until you finish up that first project. That's another important uh, important thing to know that we don't ever allow uh, two contracts at a time for the same project. Uh, so if you're doing a phased approach to your to your project, um, we'll finish out the first one and then button that up, finish the reimbursement write the contract for the second one and start that second one. So Rebecca's question is, is really important um, because we will allow you to have basically one grant waiting for you in the hopper once that first one is figured out, is finished up. We do not allow you to have a third. 
So you can have one that is waiting, but if, if in two years, you're still not finished with that first one and you want to apply for that third, you're not allowed to, you got to finish out that first one uh, before you can then apply for, for yet another. So um, yeah, great question. And, uh, and with, we allow that flexibility with, with you allowing, allowing you to have one, one stocked up, uh, but not the Store Corps pays their crew project manager and then has volunteers. So again, Jesse, if, if Historic Corps is the one paying uh, the people, then that would be an in-kind donation. And that's something to be careful or to, to just be conscious of as you're kind of putting your budget together, depending on the level of grant that you're planning to ask for. Uh, Elsa's prior comment made the prior payments have been made on the property you stated that they can be included as match. However, you also said expenditures on the project cannot be done prior to contracting. So the, the clarification there, Dale, is expenditures that the grant dollars will pay for. So we can't reimburse past expenses. So uh, you can't spend a bunch of money, apply for a grant, and then say, hey, we spent this money two years ago, give us, reimburse those dollars. That can only be match. So those payments that she's making is all match. Once we contract and then you spend more money, then we can start giving you the grant dollars after the contract is signed and you incur further expenses after the contract is signed. Does that make sense, Dale? You are muted. I didn't realize I, I could unmute. I, I think so. So, that, so what you're saying is the project can be larger than the portion of the project that we're applying for funds for. Okay, that, and, and it and it and it must be because you, because uh, you mm -hmm. have to provide match. So right. the grant can only count uh, can only pay for a third of your project. So okay, so we can be specific then about a larger project, but also say we're going to use your dollars for just this piece of it. Correct. And yep. some of that other project could have already been completed. Well, that gives us great flexibility. I was seeing the entire project as something that could be um, had to be partially funded uh, by other entities or ourselves. So, okay, this gives much greater flexibility. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. So, so for a lot of folks, especially you know organizations that are are, are on the smaller side. Um, some of these projects can stretch out over multiple years, right? Um, and yeah. so it's it's a larger facility upgrade um, and then kind of they've spent some money leading up to it. And then uh, for for this last piece, they apply for heritage capital. Um, they use all of that previous as match uh, and then they they kind of uh, get that home stretch done. For other people, yeah. it's a big future project. They mm -hmm. have funds coming in and okay. they just get, grant for just that third of the future, all future expenses. We, we try you. to have as much flexibility as we can within the okay. rules. Yeah. Um, uh, I see ours is a church and we're replacing windows and we're replacing a roof and so forth. And this has been going on for a bit and, and our dollars are going to be towards replacing a roof, but the larger project can be the, it, it can be defined as part of the, this, this uh, renovation with a green energy efficiency project that was defined a while back. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So that actually brings up a good point, which we'll talk about in future, uh, the, the more detailed project, um, uh, excuse me, uh, workshops, is that when you're applying, when you were filling out your application, mm -hmm. when you describe it, you need to describe the whole project. So okay. all of the stuff that's gonna be matched, anything that's going to be grant. So you're going to want to include those windows if you're including them as match. Um, so you're yeah. going to essentially, what that often means for, for our grantees is that the that the um, grant title essentially becomes, you know, full building rehabilitation of right. such and such building because you're doing so many different large pieces over time sometimes. Um, and, and so all of that has to, to be in the application because all right. of the match also has to be in your contract with us. So, because as you're spending the money, we're checking that you're you're um, following the scope, all the things that were agreed on. Um, so all of that has to be in the application. So again, right. we'll go into more detail with the, with the more detailed uh, workshops on March 7th and then March, nope, April 25th. So- um, Thanks so much. Yeah, come back for more. <laughs> um, okay. Scrolling a little bit, like a little more information on the lead question. 
yeah, Jody, it's a matter of of square footage, and I see David just put put um put a an, a long detailed answer in there, um in the chat there. So yeah, it's a matter of square footage, or um, uh, I think it's and the amount of money that you're spending and the value of the buildings. It's it's kind of a very specific calculus, and and we can we can work with you on that to see if it applies to you. All right, got some good thanks in the chat. Happy to help. Please. I, I I tell lots of people if um if the if you're running into a question that you can't find the answer to, I would much, much rather have you give me a call or shoot me a quick email and I can answer that question in five minutes or a quick 10 minute conversation rather than you spend multiple hours being frustrated, not knowing what to do or what the answer is or or how to fill out the form. So I mean, obviously we we, we can't submit your application for you, but if there's anything that comes up, um, uh, we're here to help. We want to be supportive. We want to. We want everyone to put their best foot forward with their application to understand the process. Um, those those guidelines updates again. I tried to 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 make it a little bit more easy to understand and just like follow step by step. Uh, but but we realize this is a this is a big undertaking for some people, and there's lots of specific rules and nuances that are are sometimes hard to understand the first path through. So please don't hesitate to reach to reach out. When does the project need to be completed? Our project is a roof rebuild that must be completed in good weather. Great question, Peggy. So the project needs to be completed by June 30th of 2027. So that is the end of the biennium. As a state uh, government, we run on uh, fiscal years, uh, two fiscal years per biennium, and they run from July 1st to June 30th. It's all very confusing, um, but we try to be uh, clear about that. So. The biennium starts July 1, 2025. That's the date, the earliest date we can contract, the earliest date you can potentially begin spending dollars that will be directly reimbursed. And then you need to finish up two years later, June 30th, 2027, the end of the funding cycle for the state, budget cycle for the state. Good question. And that's in the, there's, there's dates and stuff in the guidelines, those date lists in the guidelines have that noted so you can uh, refer back to that. Uh, da, 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 da. more lead stuff uh great webinar okay great okay i think we got through all the written that questions. wasn't lead it's it's uh lighthouse environmental program oh okay do you want to comment about that david or is this going to be a something we need, need, I, need to chat about offline okay all right so we may need to may need to look into that uh for you and and chat a little bit more if Jody's still uh, in the room. So um, we're at 10 after, I think maybe maybe five more minutes if, if folks uh, wanna bring up questions uh, verbally, um, uh, happy to stick around a little bit longer. Any questions that didn't get put in the chat or, ha or haven't been answered um, so far? You can kind of do a, throw them in the chat or, or raise, raise hand. Do you see mine? What was that one, Doug? Oh, oh, you heard me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the information. Even though this is our second attempt, um, it's always good to be refreshed. And yeah. David, I don't envy your job. It sounds like a lot of administration and operations. I just want to make sure that I understood clearly, like, if we do not use, this is going to be our second round. So if we don't use all the funds from the first round, and we're calling it now round one and two, just to keep it separated. If we do not use all the funding for whatever reason, you know, because you find different things in discovery, do we lose it? Or does it like, I thought I heard you say something that's kind of banked in someplace and then we can always go back to it and use it. Is that correct? Even though we're into another biennium. Um, great question. So what we would do in that situation, Wanda, is that we would at the end of this cycle, so your your current grant deadline is June 30th of 2025, mm -hmm. uh, actually before the end, <laughs> we would um, submit to the legislature, uh, hey, not all these funds got spent out of this project, we would like to push them forward into the next funding cycle. Um, again, it's not guaranteed. Um, until the legislature says yes and includes it in that next budget bill uh, that yes, these funds can be moved from this budget to the future budget. So if that happens, then you would have both those leftover funds and your new grant, again, if you're 
if you're successful in that second budget bill, the 25 to 27 budget bill. Okay. So what we what we would do in um, managerially is we would say, let's finish out that first contract. So let's go ahead and spend the money that needs to be spent to close out that first one before we start a new contract with you for that second round. So um, again, it's not guaranteed until the legislature uh, approves, but we would go ahead and have you spend as much as you can up until J June 30th, 25, and then hopefully uh, any unused funds will be approved by the legislature. Um, we can go past 2020, June 30, 2025, uh, go ahead and finish spending that out, wrap up that project, start a new contract with you for the second grant. That's, okay, that's, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. That's helpful. I just didn't want to, you know, if you don't use it, you lose it, you know, that concept. And that's yeah. what I'm concerned about. Okay. Yeah. It's again, like I say, it's it's not guaranteed, but but it, it, the legislature has approved funds in the past. So we, we would anticipate, especially if you were pretty close, uh, that, that, that that would be su supported. So. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, great. Any other quick questions? Nancy, I see you're talking, but you're muted. <laughs> yeah, we did the automatic mute when you joined the meeting setting, so you didn't get any stray background noise. I can also click ask to unmute. There. Oh, there yeah, you are. Can you hear me? Yeah, I oh, sure can. So, so I'm understanding that it, this this will fall, if we, if we get a grant now, that this would not pay out until 25 and then 227. Is that correct? That is correct. Also, okay. you would have to, you, you have to not spend, you, you have to not expense until 2025. So, so you can't, you can't spend the money until after we have a contract, the money that you want reimbursed. So it gets confusing because okay. we allow that, we have that flexible match period. So our match couldn't go to, our, we couldn't be using our match during 25, four, 20. You can use your 25. match. You can, but we can't pay you for your match. You see what I mean? Like, so you're spending your match now and and you're going to document right. that. And that's all going to be part of the, part of the, the, the bundle. Um, but we can but we only pay toward our match. Yeah. So we can, okay. we, when we are reimbursing you for grant dollars, what we need to see is your invoice and your proof of payment. And those dates have to be after the date your contract is signed. So all the match okay. you can, you can build up now and then we get your contract signed right away. Okay. Um, then you start spending on July 2nd, 2025. Those invoices yeah. now have that later, you know, that date on them after the contract is signed. Then you say, we spent $3,000. We have all this match from before and we say, ah, great. Here's your $3,000 in grant funds that you spent after the contract was signed. Because we're applying for, to move a building, an 1890s uh, log cabin, which is yep. a, a museum piece. And, but we have to do a lot of prep on the ground before that. Yep. And so that should be included in the whole thing then. That, that we're going to do doing the prep on the ground, which we're, we're going to try to do it this year. Fantastic. Um, Yep. Okay. That works. Yeah. And so, but then, like I say, so, some of your expenses have to happen in 2025, right? For us to pay you for, for those. So whether that's the movers or. Yeah. Yeah. That would be the mover. That, that'll that be the thing because we, we our match is going to be the preparation for the ground and Perfect. getting the water system in and electrical and all that. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Fantastic. That's great. That mm -hmm. All right. Okay. We'll give it one or two more minutes before we close out. Okay, not seeing any hands, not seeing any new chats. I just want to say that I that I I haven't worked with you for twenty years, <laughs> but but it, you helped fund a carousel building uh, oh, that we built here in the Republic, and yeah. it's been a very successful uh, piece of uh, uh, useful for the community, the building and the and the carousel. So oh, that's uh, that was, but that was uh, ninth. We finished it in uh, 21. So it was almost uh, 23 years ago. Yeah, yeah. That we actually applied for a grant and got, we actually got two two grants, one to start and another one to finish up the, the building. So well, things fantastic. haven't changed a whole lot. <laughs> well, some, I imagine. I really love visiting 
all the corners of the state. So um, I would be excited to have another project in Perry County. That sounds really exciting. Great, great. Well, we're ready. We're ready to move this building. We're, we're trying to put all of our museum stuff on one campus. Yeah. And we've, uh, that's that's the idea now and get it into a building that's a little better building. Yeah. And that'll be a, that'll be a building in the future too. But uh, yeah, so we're, awesome. we're anxious to, to get working with you and help with this. I'm excited. I know you all ha had that other building that kind of fell through a couple of years ago. And so, yeah. And, and that was not feasible. It was too yeah, long. That was a, that was was a big project. Work. It was um, over a million too. Yeah. And, that and, was... and it just wasn't feasible for the, the size of our historical society is that yep. large. Yep. And, and uh, many of them are aging out a little bit too. <laughs> and so it just, it, it just wasn't uh, practical. Yep. So what we've done is trade that into the city. They bet basically, and the, and the building really was in such bad shape, yeah. and it wasn't original. It was not original building. Yeah, at all. yeah. So well, it didn't make sense for us to pursue that. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you're readjusting, scoping to the size of your org. It sounds like I mean we we emailed a little bit, um, and uh, so I'm excited for your project, and I think it's going to be a good one. So good, good. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, yeah, we'll give it one helpful. last call for questions. Um, again, please come for more uh, workshops uh, in the future to get into the nitty gritty of the form and exactly what we're asking for. So March 7th is that um, uh, next one. E email us in the meantime. Um, we'll send out the slides, the recording, everything to everybody who registered. Um, should be able to get that out tomorrow. Um, so stay tuned uh, for more. And we look forward to working with you all this, uh, this cycle. Okay. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.